Hi guys, my name is Ollie. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Warwick and welcome back to my interview prep series. This is a really hotly requested video topic. We're finally talking about the lessons we can learn from COVID-19. A lot of you have been writing in clearly feeling as though medical schools are likely to ask about COVID. I don't know how likely this is myself. I'm not sure what the value uh, necessarily would be, but the way I'm going to frame this video is what are the lessons that we can learn from the crisis what have we learned um, in the NHS and what can we take forward and maybe apply to our own clinical thinking and our own understanding in the future should something like this happen again. And I'd also suggest you don't need to have too much medical knowledge about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But as with most things when it comes to interviews, what's going to be more helpful is being able to place the issue in a wider context and taking away the key lessons. And these are just my own musings and takeaways. So take everything with a pinch of salt, but these are the important things that I feel as though I've observed over the last year or so. So firstly, we have learned a huge amount about human behavior and the need for effective leadership. You might consider the different types of reaction from the general public, which range from complete terror, I'm gonna shut myself inside and never leave, to the other end of the spectrum, where we have complete denial that COVID even exists and any attempts at a vaccine are some sort of hoax perpetrated by Bill Gates to try and microchip us all or something like that. And both of these reactions, this overhyping in some cases or complete denialism in others, all of this continues to happen even as research paper after research paper is churned out and we're learning more and more about the nature of this disease and how best to manage it. So then that brought me on to thinking, well, how is anyone supposed to actually try and tackle this problem or come up with a meaningful solution when we have this range of reactions, particularly that subset that doesn't believe that the virus even exists? How can you design an intervention where no matter what you do, you have to assume that some amount of the public is never going to engage with it? And so any solution that the NHS or the government puts forward, you will have to assume some degree of subtotal compliance, whether that's a vaccine or some other program. And that's going to be an incredible challenge with something like COVID. And now we're approaching the stage where one of many candidate vaccines may become suitable for mass deployment. But what does that even mean if not everyone in the population is willing to take it and we can't convince enough people to reach the levels of immunization that we would need for vaccination to work. And that's also not to suggest that everyone is willfully ignorant because although they were small in number, we have seen nurses, doctors, surgeons um, coming out and being very vocal at things like anti-lockdown protests, anti-mask rallies. You have members of the medical workforce backing up these these pretty fringe ideas. So to some degree, it's perfectly understandable for the public to be skeptical or misunderstanding of what the majority of the medical workforce tries to put forwards. And it's extremely clear that we need strong leadership and strong guidelines and strong adoption of those guidelines. But again, what does that mean when you have health professionals who are seen to be figures of authority speaking out against those guidelines? Who is the public supposed to trust or take seriously. And the last thing I want to say about that is that we really need to avoid labeling these people who aren't sure what to do or are unwilling to take guidelines seriously as idiots or as miscreants, because that's the only surefire way to make sure they never engage with us again. That's almost the only intervention that will achieve precisely nothing and fuel them further in bringing more people over to their side. So we need to continue to keep our dialogue and engagement as high as we can. Now thinking a little bit more broadly, the pandemic has also highlighted some real strengths and weaknesses of the UK health system, including the NHS. Remember that the NHS doesn't exist in isolation in the UK. There are plenty of private providers and other elements of healthcare that aren't provided by the NHS, but it's the biggest player in the game. And despite the NHS existing as this kind of monolithic, bureaucratic, lumbering nightmare, um, which it is, to be fair, it has demonstrated a surprising amount of flexibility during the COVID pandemic. And that is in no small part because of the quality and the ingenuity and the work ethic of the people who work for the NHS. We've seen some really remarkable things, things like the opening of the enormous Nightingale hospitals with thousands of extra ventilated beds, mass COVID testing taking place up and down the UK, 
with at least some semblance of a tracing system going on and other very large scale changes. These things are not easy with something as big and complicated as the NHS and we've seen loads of these things happening at once. But then we can consider the problem through a more local lens because staff of all grades, clinical and non-clinical, had to adapt very quickly to constantly changing guidelines and huge amounts of uncertainty. There was absence of the correct PPE to do the jobs properly and there were often no clear directions from above about what exactly people should do in very challenging scenarios. People were operating a lot more autonomously. And having worked in an acute unit myself during the first peak of COVID as a healthcare assistant, the doctors and nurses on shop floor, as it were, were having to make very difficult decisions about who should be treated, who shouldn't be treated, the order in which we should treat people, whether it was even safe to treat people. And actually often, they were risking their own lives in treating people if the correct PPE wasn't available. And in very extreme cases, this left to people being left on ambulances as the intensive care units were at capacity and those emergency doctors had to make the call about who would be admitted to hospital and who couldn't be admitted and would ultimately die on the ambulance. Staff numbers were also massively reduced. The NHS has a constant problem with lack of staff going on all the time, this was made even worse during COVID, where anyone with even the slightest hint of a respiratory condition probably had to isolate, even if they had a common cold, because you don't know what anyone's got acutely. Even if their partners or their kids uh, became sick, that staff member would be lost. And not just that, but staff were constantly being reallocated and moved around between departments. The training of junior doctors was actually completely frozen during the first peak, so that service could be provided. Remember that the constant theme for your medical school interviews always has to be that patient care is the number one priority. And we rely on the training of doctors and nurses to continue, but that all had to be halted to make sure that patients were looked after properly. And alongside all of that, we also had huge numbers of retired doctors, nurses, healthcare staff being brought back in to maintain those staffing levels. So in short, you have a bit of a perfect storm of not enough staff. The staff that you do have are either working in conditions and situations that aren't familiar to them, or they may not have worked in a long time. And most sadly of all, of course, is that many of our colleagues lost their lives trying to do what they could for other people and kind of paid the ultimate price for doing so. And the last key thing that has probably affected me more than most as I'm still a student is this transition to an increasingly online world. Medical students like myself have had ever decreasing amounts of clinical exposure and massive amounts of teaching is being delivered via conference calls, as are patient consultations. The effects of prolonged isolation we're starting to see creep in everywhere as rates of depression, suicide, other mental health problems are starting to climb. People are becoming increasingly hesitant to even attend either hospital or their GP appointments at all, and so they're only presenting later when things go really badly wrong, and their symptoms are much more potentially dangerous. And we also have this problem of huge surgical backlogs are being created by the fact that surgeons haven't been able to operate properly for infection control reasons during the height of COVID, and the likelihood is, is that we're going to be dealing with this backlog for years, as more people are waiting for simple operations, things like joint replacement, cataract, all of that stuff has been pushed back and the backlog, the pile of work is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it shows absolutely no sign of slowing down. So in short, the COVID-19 pandemic has turned the health service on its head as it has done most of our ways of life. But to return to the actual question, what can we learn? Finding novel solutions to these problems and maintaining clear leadership and guidelines throughout this whole process is extremely difficult and maybe it's impossible. However, we are capable of adaptive change and progress when it's required. And by and large, the NHS as an organization has done really well. Although sadly, we have still lost huge numbers of staff and patients. And lastly, the thing to remember is that there will likely never be a perfect solution to any of these problems because we have a struggling system with a limited amount of resources. Any plan we make, any actions we try and complete are probably going to be at the expense of one group or another. It's a case of prioritising and unfortunately when we do that someone has to lose out. Whether that's increased surgical waiting times or worsening mental health during a national lockdown, you pick your poison. A quick note on vaccines, obviously the progress and the speed at which these things have been developed during the Covid pandemic is unprecedented 
vaccines have never been put through trials as fast as they have been in the last year. And if we get these new mRNA vaccines out, which are a new type that we've never tried before and have a working solution that's suitable for mass deployment, that will be nothing short of incredible. Vaccines take years to get right. And the fact that multiple groups have been able to come up with viable candidates, which appear safe, you know, at least speaking at the moment, that that is nothing short of a miracle. So that's where we're going to wrap, guys. Don't forget to go ahead and hit that like button, leave me a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out ollieburton.com for my full course of interview videos and more hints and tips just like these. Take care and I will see you next time.